Good morning, Searchlight. We're glad to have you joining us for church online as we worship the Lord together. Come on, let's sing this out. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roll I'm from the ashes hope will arise death is
worthy of praise, God. Come on, right there in your home, just begin to lift your hands, lift your voices as we sing these words to Him. Come on, let's raise a hallelujah. your name, God. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. God, for everything that you've done for us. God, you never leave us. You never forsake us, God. God, you continue to be there through everything that we go through, God. We just put our hope and our trust in you this morning. Hallelujah. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Come on, sing that again. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone cornerstone the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all when darkness seems to hide his face on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within my anchor holds within the veil
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Hallelujah. Come on, right now there in your homes. Come on, just lift your hands. I know you're not together with us here in the building, but just God is present in your home right now. And so, Jesus, we just exalt you. Right there in our homes, God, we just, we just praise your name. Right there in your homes, just, just take a moment just to sit quietly before him. God, we just, we just thank you for your goodness, God, for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. Lord, we're thankful that we don't have to be perfect, that we don't have to get it right all the time, God. We can just come before you, God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is sufficient for us, God. We lay our burdens down at your feet this morning, God. Worthy is your name. stories of
can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father so worthy you know when it's all said and done it's all about Jesus and everything else is going on around us when darkness seems to be wanting to cloud our vision of him and he comes walking in the room the whole room lights up it's all about Jesus one of my favorite parts of the scripture is when he's already risen from the dead and they're out there fishing and they see him off on the beach. They recognize him and they run to him. And what's he doing? He's got a fire going. He's cooking some fish. And he's hanging out with his guys. The resurrected, glorified Christ. Why? Because that's the reason he came. And if you haven't been spending time with him this week, you need to start spending more time with him. Because you will be filled and you will have peace. And God will come into your life like you never, never, ever dream. Because that's why he came. He came for you. And he came for me. To hang out, to talk, to have fellowship. And bring us back to the garden where we once began. So let's go to the Father in prayer. And there's many, many needs on our hearts this morning. So many that need the touch of Christ, the need the touch of God. So as the Lord brings people into your mind this morning, as you take a moment to pray, allow God to move through you by the power of the Holy Spirit to touch those in need. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us. God, and you are coming back soon. God, this is your world. It's not ours. God, sometimes we walk around with such arrogance, like we have everything under control, and the world is ours to do with what we want. But, Father, it all belongs to you. And thanks to your precious blood, we belong to you. Father God, so touch us, Lord. God, you see the the needs that are on our hearts. You see the people that are on our hearts. Lord, move by the power of your Spirit, according to your grace and your love, you're just abundant faithfulness and we'll give you all the thanks and all the praise because there's none like you father god there's none like you in jesus name we pray everyone said amen trust him and believe in him he's the truth the life and the way amen You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris, and I'd like to take a moment to welcome you to Searchlight Church Online. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook and YouTube, and we hope that this online church experience is exactly what you need today. 
At this time, we'd love for everyone to fill out their online connection card. This is the best way to make sure that we stay connected with your family. You can find the link in the post right next to this video. So take a moment right now and fill yours out. If this is your first time with us, select that corresponding box and let us know so we can personally thank you for coming to church online. On this card, you can also let us know if you're interested in getting more information about life groups, serve teams, or taking your next steps in your spiritual journey. Also, if you have any prayer requests or testimonies that you'd like to share, write them down in the space provided, and we'll be sure to pray for you during the week. There's a lot of great stuff happening here at Searchlight, and here are a few things just to take note of. First up, for the last few weeks, we've been holding live outdoor services, and they have been awesome. These services have averaged about 50 people in attendance, and they've been a great time of worshiping together. From this point forward, every Sunday, we will host an online service at 9 a.m. right here on Facebook and YouTube. And then at 1030, we'll meet in the picnic area directly behind Seashore on Broadway in Long Branch. If you'd like to join us outside for the 1030 service, please bring a chair or a blanket and wear a mask. And We can't wait to see everyone. Second, we're planning on holding this year's bike blessing on Sunday, August 30th, together with Long Branch Covenant Church. We'll be, uh, we'll be needing a bunch of volunteers, so if you're interested in helping out, please let Bob Keegan know. You can also sign up uh, on your connection card or email us at hello at searchlightchurch.com. Lastly, next week we'll be starting a new series of online daily devotionals. So if these videos have helped you in the past and you want to get involved in a new series, make sure to subscribe on our, to our YouTube page uh, and like the Facebook page. More information will be following this week about the topic and the content of that devotional. At this time, we want to bring our tithes and our offerings back to God through online giving, and we want to say a huge thank you for your continued financial support. There are three ways that you can give here at Searchlight. First, if you'd like to participate in this offering by giving cash or a check, you can mail that to the church administrative offices. The address is Searchlight Church, 1 Main Street, Suite 203, Eatontown, New Jersey, 07724. You can also give through PayPal on our church website, or you can use the Tithely app and give right from your smartphone. If you're not sure how to give online, it's easy. Just go to searchlightchurch.com, click the button at the top right that says give, then select the donate button at the bottom right of the page to select PayPal or Tithely. So after we pray for the offering, go ahead and send in your online tithes and offerings this morning. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today for the opportunity to be in church, whether it's online or at 1030 outside, and we're equally grateful to be able to participate in today's offering. Lord, we know that your word says you love a cheerful giver, that we should come and not give out of any kind of compulsion or guilt, so we come and we bring our offerings before you, God, so that your kingdom can be furthered. I pray, Lord, that you would multiply it and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom so that we can continue to reach and teach people to live and love like you. Bless every gift and every giver, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So now let's give it up for Pastor Tim as he brings part two of the Upside Down Kingdom. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us at Church Online today. We're so glad you took some time out of your day to uh, spend some time with us this morning. Whether you're watching this Sunday live or you're watching it later on in the week or the month of the year, we're so glad that you joined us for church this morning. My name's Tim. If I didn't get a chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors here at Searchlight Church, and I get the great privilege of bringing the Word of God today. And if you uh, were with us last week, you know that this is actually week two of a brand new teaching series as we're walking through what's called the Beatitudes. It's, it's from the Sermon on the Mount, probably the, the teaching Jesus is most famous for, maybe the most famous sermon in all of history, and probably one we follow the least. And so if you missed week one, Pastor Chris did a great job introducing us to the, the concept and kind of explaining the first Beatitude. Go back right now, actually not right now, but after you're done watching this on YouTube or Facebook, and you can catch week one where Pastor Chris explained what the poor in spirit means. 
we're calling this series the Upside Down Kingdom. And the reason we are calling it that is because what Jesus says, what Jesus calls us to, it reorients our entire life. In fact, it takes all the things that we think is a win, the things that we define as good or wrong in our lives, the things that we aim for, our goals and our dreams, and he changes everything that we think that we have a grasp on, and he redefines it in a certain way. He changes why we're here, how we live, and what's important. And so it's different from your expectations, and that's why we're calling this the upside-down kingdom. It's not normal. It's not expected. In fact, most people miss it because everybody else is just walking by in a different way with a different set of values. In fact, Jesus says the majority of people live this way and miss the upside-down kingdom. As he's wrapping this up, he says in Matthew 7, he's kind of closing this whole sermon. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there or download the Version Bible app. Or if you don't have it, the words will be here behind me. But Jesus actually says in Matthew 7, talking about the upside-down kingdom, he says this, You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide. For there are many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few find it. You know what's kind of scary about that is it says, like, you don't even have to think for a second to miss out on heaven. Just do what comes naturally to you. Just follow your heart. Just live your life. You only live once, so make the most of it. It's kind of scary because the way is wide, Jesus says, and the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and it's crowded. And so the upside-down kingdom doesn't come naturally to us. Uh, in fact, that's your first fill-in. If you download your note card with us today, it's just to help us kind of follow along some main ideas. You can go back and read the scriptures later in the week. But your first fill-in on your note card is this. Not everyone gets it. Not everyone gets the upside-down kingdom. Because in the normal world, you know this, crowded means you're probably heading in the right direction, Right? All the rides at Six Flags everyone wants to be on, there's a huge line. Everyone's there, right? If you live in New Jersey, you know that everybody trying to get in the beach is going down Route 36, right? They're literally sitting in traffic, all heading towards the beach. But you as a local know the beaches have been closed since noon, and they can go all they want, but they're not getting in the beach unless they're a local. And they know that secret local's beach down the side street that I'm not going to tell you about, right? It's crowded just because everybody's heading in the direction that should get them where they want to be doesn't mean they're going to get in. And that's what Jesus is saying about crowds, is that the road that misses the upside-down kingdom, the kingdom of this world is wide, and lots of people are on it. Just because a lot of people are doing it doesn't mean it's right. Go ahead, ask your mother, right? If she says, if everyone jumps off a bridge, would you do it too? If a crowd is doing it, would you do it? And I tell my mom, no, you raised a leader. I'm leading them off the bridge. I don't know if it's smart or not, but I'm going to get there first. It doesn't matter what the crowd is doing is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, there are lots of people who are going that direction, and all of them are going to miss the mark of finding salvation. And that's why us, the church, you and I, not a building that's closed or open or outside. It's not a place. It's us people who have this message of hope. We have a huge task before us because there's a crowd of people running in the wrong direction along a wide route, and we have to point them to a smaller, narrow gate, right? Jesus says the gate to eternal life is small, so wake up, pay attention. You might miss it. You know this when you're driving down the highway, and you see the exit come up too fast. You're like, was that the one? Sometimes when we're going through life, when we, something stops us and gets our attention, we're like, was that the important thing? Did I just miss it? That's how Jesus describes the gate to the upside-down kingdom, that if you want to find this small gate, you have to know a few things that aren't obvious in the kingdom of this world. And that's what he's laying out, is that this upside-down kingdom has different expectations and different uh, characteristics of people who are living for this kingdom. And so last week, Pastor Chris kicked off this entire series when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, what we call poverty of spirit, because those people get the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit people know that they're spiritually bankrupt, right? They, they, they are sinners. They, the only thing that they bring to Jesus is the sin that would put Jesus on the cross. Uh, I think of it this way, right? If I called up Jeff Bezos and I said, hey, let's do a business deal. I'm going to bring my negative $250,000 mortgage, and you throw in two, and we'll go buy ESPN. Everyone knows I'm the poor one. Everyone knows I don't bring anything to this deal. I know it. He knows it. Everyone watching knows it. And it's the same thing with our spiritual life. In the same way, I'm spiritually poor, so I know I need a Savior. I don't have enough to do what I want to get done. And in fact, I know that I bring baggage. I bring self-righteousness. I bring junk that won't fit through this gate. And so spiritually poor people 
understand they have to let go of that junk to get through the gate that's narrow. You can't bring all your stuff with us. Last week, Pastor Chris explained your spiritual possessions, your good works, they're like filthy rags. To get through the gate, you have to let them go to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so what's the secret, right? Do you want to hear how you find this upside-down kingdom? If you'll just send $29.99 to, no, it's not a big secret. In fact, Jesus declares it publicly for everyone to know. The gate is small, but it's not secretive. It's not elusive. Jesus says in John 10, I am the gate. If you want to enter the upside-down kingdom, you only come through Jesus. And so the rich in spirit, they get this world. They're self-made and self-aggrandizing, and someone at their funeral will say they had a really nice car, and it looked like they had their life together. But they're going to miss out on heaven because they built their kingdom and missed the upside-down kingdom. They missed the gate. What they see is as good as it will ever get, and then it gets much, much worse. And so if any of that offends you, I'm going to need you to take it up with Jesus because I'm just literally repeating the things that he said. But this week, I actually want to help you understand what the upside-down kingdom is all about because uh, that's what Jesus does, is he turns our expectations upside down. Jesus never fits in the box we, we wish he would, and Jesus tends to turn our lives upside down when we start to actually follow him because his kingdom is upside down to us. And so that brings us to our second beatitude. If you're following along, the beatitudes are found in Matthew chapter 5. And I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 5 verse 4. This is the second blessed attitude that Jesus says. He says, God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. God blesses those who mourn. And I started thinking about that. It doesn't make a lot of sense to call people who mourn blessed. Blessed, and you'll see that through all these Beatitudes. How does it make sense? How are you blessed by these things? In fact, the world would say all these people, they're losers. They're the unfortunate. They're the ones that God doesn't like. Look what's happening in their life. Look through that list. And here's the secret to all that, that upside down is confusing when you can't tell up from down. In fact, the way that the world judges things is wrong. And so while they may think that we are struck by God, forgotten by God, hurt by God, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Look at, look at this list. How can you call these people blessed, right? Blessed are those who mourn. That's somebody who lost something, that's missing something, that's deficient in this world. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You mean like those who need a crutch? The low self-esteem losers who need something to get them through this life? Blessed are the humble. You mean the weak, the ones who will never be great because they don't seize the moment? You mean the hungry who are lacking, who won't ever have enough? You mean the merciful who don't have the power to do what is necessary? Because from a worldly perspective, if you're building a dream team of accomplishers who are going to seize the day and take control and build something great in this world, None of these people are on that list. And that's what Jesus does. Is he turns it on its head because upside down, the upside down world is convinced that it's right, but they don't understand what right side up even is. There is power in mourning, in the loss of something. In fact, I love how Paul in Philippians lays this out when he says to die is gain. To die is gain, right? That's the secret of spiritual growth, right? If we're going to have a super spiritual retreat where I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go die. This is the shortcut to spiritual maturity. I don't know that we get a lot of people to sign up. They'll be like, that's great. My kid needs that. You know, the person down the street, they need that. But die, gain, I don't think so. It doesn't make sense to me. We have to understand that it doesn't make sense to a kingdom that's not upside down. And so what Paul is saying here, what Jesus is laying out through the Beatitudes is your next fill in that godly mourning is better than worldly pleasure. Godly mourning is better than worldly pleasure. And godly mourning is really kind of lacking uh, in, in the current church, I think. There's a lot of churches where there's this, this temptation. I, I feel it too as a preacher to always want to say the affirming things to everybody to build up self-esteem to let you know that God wants you happy and healthy and blessed and then we'll take an offering. People love that message. But, but sometimes the message of the Bible is that um, sometimes life sucks. Sometimes life is difficult, and we need to remember that this world is not our home. So we should get used to the idea that we shouldn't be comfortable here, that we should be not looking to make this our permanent residence, but we're just passing through on our way to the upside-down kingdom. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, says in Ecclesiastes 7, Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has refining influence on us. Who would rather go to funerals? 
What, what kind of sicko would rather spend their life at a funeral than at a party? Upside down people. People who understand that it's better to remember your own mortality than to try and numb out everything about your day-to-day -day life. Because mourning lets you focus on what's really important. Think about the last funeral that you went to. It stopped you in your tracks. It made you think about your life and what you were doing and what you were living for and what you were dying for because funerals change how you view things. And you know this to be true about your life, that all the deep change, all the things that made you who you are, that, that changed how you viewed the world happened after a loss, happened after something died that made you mourn. Maybe it was a job or a dream. It could have been a person, but something made you stop and take stock of your life. Because funerals lead to a refining influence, Solomon says. And we know that it's, not, it's better than going and getting drunk and forgetting the last 12 or 24 or however many hours you need. Because when the music dies, when the people are gone, when you're sitting alone, if you haven't dealt with anything, you'll never grow. You'll never change. You'll never become who God has designed you to be. In fact, you might miss the narrow gate because the music is too loud and you're running with the crowd. But a funeral makes you stop and take stock of your life. Blessed are those who mourn, who, at the, who are at the end of themselves and have nothing and are aware of it. And that's what funerals do to you, right? Funerals make you realize that control is an illusion and that if you want to understand the deep truths of what God is trying to do in you, a funeral gets you thinking that way. It shakes you from the lie that you are powerful or so important or in control. In fact, here's what a funeral does. It reminds you that you're not God. And that's what spiritually poor people understand. And that's what mourning leads to. I am not God, therefore there is something I need to be made whole. And that's how you find comfort. And so what I want to challenge us to do today is your next fill in that we thank God when we have opportunities to mourn. Better to go to a funeral. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? How is that a blessing? How is that a good thing? Because those, those of you who have mourned a loved one, know that in this time, God is not just something. God is not a platitude. God is not a Bible verse on the back of an Instagram quote, but God is everything to you. It, it cuts through the noise of the day. Opportunities to mourn stop you and make you seek out something that will really comfort your soul. When things are going great, when do you think of God, right? Think about this. Just be honest with yourself. When things are going great, how often do you think about God, right? Maybe a sunrise, maybe your kid, Maybe you think about the devil when you see your kid. I don't know where you are. But there's something in your life when you are so busy, when things are going good, when you have no issues, when you never had to mourn something, God's there, but you don't pay any attention to him because there's 39 other things you're focused on. And, and here's the thing about life. When mourning comes, when those other 38 things all fail you, when you're left with just one to console you, to comfort you, Jesus remains. And the beauty of that is that Jesus is enough for your mourning. Jesus is enough for your hurt. It's not just a temporary comfort. He brings an eternal comfort day in and day out, even if life doesn't go as you hope. When you know who Jesus is, you know he is still God and he is still good. And so we need to be looking for opportunities sometimes to mourn because God sends us those opportunities to get our attention sometimes. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, Paul says he had a thorn in his flesh that he begged God to take away. It says this in verse 8. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work within me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Listen, Paul's a good guy. We love the Apostle Paul. It's a great attitude. Here's my first thought when I read that. I don't want God's power. I want my comfort. I don't want to hear how God's power is going to be made perfect through my weakness. I don't want to feel weak. I don't want to feel tired. I don't want to feel overwhelmed. I'd rather keep up this illusion because that's my kingdom. That's my way. That's my timing. That's my pleasure. That's my will. And guess what? That's not God's kingdom because his kingdom is upside down to the things that I value, to my will. And, and when you can't walk in your own power anymore, then God gets the glory. When you can't go through another day and God still wakes you up and sustains you and comforts you in the midst of your mourning, in the midst of your hardship, when you feel ingloriously vulnerable and can't take another step, but God keeps moving through you, God looks very big, even though you feel very small. 
And so we understand that God will use your circumstances to show his glory to the world. And sometimes it's at the expense of our lives because that's what living and loving like Jesus looks like sometimes. So thank God for opportunities to mourn because that's one of the things Jesus did. And we'll get to that in a second. Understand that mourning resets our priorities and our perspectives. Uh, while, while we are busy mourning the loss of our grandiose plans and our reputation and all the things we thought made us great, God is offering us eternity. God is saying your kingdom doesn't stack up very well. And so the kingdom of comfort that you're building is opposite of what I'm trying to give you. And, and so when people see you seeking this upside down kingdom, the kingdom of God in spite of what's going on, God looks very big. God gets a lot of glory. How can these people, these Christ followers, how can these people who mourn get up and face another day? How can they possibly be upbeat? How can they possibly smile? How is it that those in mourning are not crushed by the pain of it? Because God is enough. And when God is enough, as you decrease, Jesus increases. In fact, that's why John the Baptist says, right, in John 3.30, he says, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. You're like, okay, so then I guess John just like goes off the pages of history and makes way for Jesus. Well, John got beheaded after making the way for Jesus. He disappeared from the pages of history, not because uh, he was just done with his time, but Jesus actually used him to make a way and then he decreased. This man understood what it means to become less and less. And so if all we do is run down the wide path, if all we do is try to make much of ourselves, if all we do is try and shake off mourning and pretend we have it all together, if all we do is live for our glory and our comfort and avoid difficult conversations and loving difficult people, if all we do is try to avoid hard times, we're missing the kingdom of God because we won't see God in the middle of the hardships of life, in the middle of mourning. We'll just keep skipping down that wide path with everyone else. But mourning, stopping in our tracks, actually resets our priorities and our perspectives. And, and that's why last week was so important, because spiritual poverty reminds us it's okay to face hard times. It's okay to face hardships that lead to mourning. Jesus was the only one who could handle everything we need anyway. So come to him with our pain and our mourning. Those who mourn will be comforted. That is the blessing of it. And those who see that comfort that God has provided will notice that God is great, uh, God's grace is big enough for you. And so that's part of our being part of the kingdom, is letting other people see God even through our mourning. And here's what's really important. Understanding God is enough gives us permission to mourn. It gives us permission to not be perfect. It's not weak or pathetic or sad. Uh, the spiritually and poor people mourn. They mourn their weakness. They, they, they mourn so that God can be our strength. They understand that God is our comfort and our priority. And we have to get comfortable with mourning because we need to understand that mourning our sin is healthy. Mourning our sin is healthy. That's your next fill-in. Mourning is healthy. When something causes us pain, when we realize loss, we mourn, right? The worst thing you can say to somebody who's mourning a loss is to say you shouldn't feel that way. You should cover it up. You should not feel that. The thing is that mourning is a natural part of being human. And so we realize loss, we mourn. And here's the thing. Sin causes us pain. It causes us the loss of our relationship with our creator. In fact, it continues to cause separation, loss of familiarity with Jesus even today. So we need to mourn what our sin does. Mourning is healthy. Mourning is agreeing with God that you are spiritually poor, that I am spiritually bankrupt and in need of a savior. That's what mourning does. In fact, a sign of spiritual poverty is mourning what sin does in your life and in the world. And here's the thing. God hates sin. God hates sin because sin hurts his kids. And you know this as a parent, as a, an uncle or an aunt, as somebody in the world. When you see something that hurts someone you love, you hate that thing. You do anything you can to stop it. It's a big deal. A good father is disgusted by things that hurt his kids. And sin breaks the heart of God because sin will always break you. It will always cause pain to his children. So God wants us to avoid the loss that sin always brings. So mourning is agreeing with God. Mourning is healthy because it makes us go, that sin, that thing is terrible. It's causing me pain. It's going to cause me deeper loss. God doesn't give us commands to box us in or to take away our good times and 
I have a lot of conversations with people about this where it's like, well, God just wants to, to take away my fun. God doesn't want me to have a human experience. God wants me to be less and just be somebody who checks the box and follow rules. And nothing could be further from the truth. God doesn't want sin to hurt you. So God wants us to mourn our sin instead of celebrate it. When God says, honor me with your sexuality, he's not trying to take away your fun. He just knows that pornography or sleeping with people that you aren't married to and made a lifelong commitment to is actually going to break you emotionally and spiritually and sometimes physically. God doesn't tell you to honor him with your money because he wants your money. He wants to take away the power of a false God that will let you down. God isn't offended by just the curse word that you say. God knows that out of your mouth comes the abundance of your heart. And so if he, God doesn't have your words and your tone and your attitude, he probably hasn't filled your heart. And, and so it's kind of scary to be in a place where you don't mourn your sin or the things that sin causes because kingdom of God people understand that sin leads to loss. And so you mourn the things that lead to loss. We need to be people who are sad over our sin, who understand its pain and spiritually bankrupt people always end up in a place of forgiveness. But people who deny the power of sin can't end up in a place of forgiveness because they don't think they need forgiving. Mourning your sin agrees with God that you are spiritually bankrupt. If you don't mourn your sin, you think your sin doesn't cost you, and you are wrong because the wages of sin is always death. Even Jesus mourned sin. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, which is something that always kind of blew my mind, because literally in five minutes, he's going to raise this guy from the dead, give him a high five, and go eat lunch. Why is he crying? Because Jesus is mourning over the cost of sin. The cost of sin is death, physical death, eternal spiritual death, separation from him. He'd overcome it, but he was still broken at the thought of it, broken at the sight of it, broken to encounter it. Does the sin you see in the world break your heart? and cause you to mourn. Let's mourn our own sin. Understand the, the weight of it, the depth of it, and let's be okay mourning the tragedies in the world so that we can be comforted. Because until we mourn our sin, until we mourn the sin in the world, we won't receive comfort. So let me talk about when mourning is happy. Because mourning isn't just for mourning's sake, but mourning actually leads to something good in our lives. Let me give you four things that lets mourning be a happiness. Number one, when it leads to repentance when it leads to repentance. Paul wrote these letters to all different churches around kind of dealing with issues. He was kind of pastoring from a distance uh, and overseeing some crazy things that were going on. And if you know anything about the church in Corinth, you can read First and Second Corinthians. There is just nutty things happening that make you blush. And, and so Paul writes some sternly worded letters sometimes to some of these people. And it's particularly pointed, putting your finger on something and dealing with the difficulty. He says this in Second Corinthians 7, starting in verse 8. I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful for you for a little while. This is a father saying, when I give you a spanking or put you in timeout, this hurts me more than it hurts you. You don't believe him at the moment, but that's what's going on here. Now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the, it was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Just see what the godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to, to clear, clear yourself, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such a readiness to punish wrong. You showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right. What he's saying is, listen, when I pointed out your sin, it hurt. It was a hard conversation. It might have made you cry. You might have felt personally attacked. When I pointed this out to you, it produced sorrow. And because you started mourning your sin, though, because you realized what sin was doing in your lives, when I pointed it out to you, it led to repentance. It led to a change, not only a feeling, but a change in behavior, because godly mourning produces life change. Putting your finger on your sin, it may hurt you, but that's how you find healing. When you mourn, you will be comforted. When you mourn your sin, you will find forgiveness. Uh, I remember one of my counseling professors telling me, listen, Tim, you would rather sit down with a person a hundred times and point out their sin and have them get mad at you 
than receive that one phone call at night that they blew up their lives or their marriage or their relationship with their kids because they hid their sin and you didn't lead them to godly sorrow. Bring people to a place of mourning sin so that they can repent of it, so that they can change their priorities and their perspectives, which leads me to the question I was wrestling with all as I wrote this sermon, which is, have you cried over your sin? And I was thinking about this, I'm kind of getting older, and you know, when you're, you're younger, it's like nor- more normal sometimes to like wander off and cry and be a little bohemian. I did grow up in the 90s, so Kurt Cobain, that whole thing. But I was more okay with being emotional, and the older I get, the more I feel like I need to put on a show. The more I feel like it's harder to be genuine, the more I feel like it's okay, especially as a man, to feel like I can mourn. I used to go down to the beach all the time at like 2 in the morning. I used to walk the boardwalk in Long Branch down at the end of Brighton Beach, and I would pray, and I'd listen to worship music, and I would dream about planting churches, and I would mourn the bad decisions that I've made and the sins in my life and ask God of forgiveness to, to help me change. I would feel the weight of my sin putting Jesus on the cross, and sometimes I would cry. I would, I would actually be overwhelmed with mourning for the fact that Jesus died in my place for me. And, and that's what the gospel is. That's a beautiful thing. And uh, I haven't cried that much uh, recently, and I think I'm a little bit less for it. When's the last time you felt the weight of your sin? When's the last time in worship you wept because of what God did for you? Not just because we have incredibly talented singers or musicians, but when's the last time you let the weight of what Jesus did for you overwhelm you, that lets you mourn and then be comforted in the same moment? Because God wants us to understand that he hasn't just forgiven us for us to forget but to remember how far he's taken us, that he's leading us through repentance. He paid a huge price to get us back. And so mourning sin should, jump, should come naturally. If we go through our lives jumping from day to day, hobby to hobby, relationship to relationship, job to job, and we never actually stop to weep over what our sin has done in our lives, what sin is doing in the world, we may be missing the power of mourning to lead us to repentance. Because mourning is happy, number two, when it gives you a burden for others. Not just you, but when it gives you a burden for other people. If you read all through the Old Testament, many times the prophets, they wept at the state of the people. Jeremiah, who wrote Jeremiah and Lamentations, was called the weeping prophet because he was broken by what he saw in the people of Israel. Jesus wept over the people of Jerusalem as he arrived at the city, knowing what people were doing on this wide path, missing all the things that God had for them, going about their business. David wrote in Psalms 119, 136, rivers of tears gushed from my eyes because people disobeyed your instructions. When was the last time you looked around at your friends or coworkers or people you disagree with or people in your town and your heart broke? That, that you mourned for these people because they don't know or follow Jesus. They're missing out on the comfort. H- have you prayed for the candidate you hate as much as you criticize them? Right? Have you prayed for the people on Facebook you disagreed with? H- have you prayed for people in your life that don't look or talk or vote like you? Have you shared the hope of Jesus with the people in your life that need it? Because people don't need your opinion. They don't need your political thought. They don't need, fine, be active in the world. But understand, none of those things are the solution. If God thought the solution to our world was a politician, he would have sent us one. He sent us Jesus, a Savior who laid down his life. And so when we disagree with people, when we see people around us, we need to understand that the people we disagree with are just mourning people who need comfort in Jesus. And right now, if they don't know him, they're seeking comfort anywhere else. And they're not going to find it. When is mourning happy? When it leads you to repentance, and then when it gives you a burden for your neighbors. To understand that mourning leads us to have a burden for others because people who have lost and been hurt and have mourned, once they've found comfort, it's easier for them to give them out. Which leads us to the third thing, when it leads to real comfort. Mourning is happy when it leads to real comfort. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 5.4. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And this is a beautiful Bible verse. Uh, if you know, you're doing well in life, or, you know, you're young, you haven't gone through a bunch of things yet. This is a cool verse that fits on a coffee mug, right? You share this on your Instagram story and move on in life, because it's just a platitude. But if you've been through something incredibly difficult in your life, you've been deeply uh, wounded, you've, you've lost a loved one, you've gotten a diagnosis, you've gone through a bankruptcy, you know all you want is to be told it's going to be okay. 
all you want is comfort. If you've ever faced your own death, if you've ever faced a child that, won't, uh, that you can't help, that won't go the direction you want them to go, or a difficulty you can't overcome, then this verse, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, becomes everything and not a platitude. And listen, if it hasn't happened to you yet, give it time. Unfortunately, it probably will at some point. You'll get a phone call, you'll be in a hospital room, you'll be alone, and a pithy saying from a TV preacher or some kind of Instagram post or online thing that you like doesn't mean anything. All you want is to be comforted. And all you have then is this verse, this promise that those who mourn will be comforted. All be comforted on the other side. God is my comfort. God is enough. I will get through this. I will see him face to face. That's the promise of Revelation 21. If you go and read through that, we'll see God face to face. And it says he'll wipe every tear away from our eye. And here's something about that. I think that means that uh, as we go even to the presence of God, we'll still be mourning. We'll, We'll still have this thing hanging on to us. God will actually wipe our tears away. That's where comfort comes in because morning time is over when we come into the presence of a God who makes everything beautiful in his time. If you have the courage to mourn, then you can receive the loving comfort of God. Not like the world offers comfort because the world offers every kind of counterfeit temporary thing that it can, but lasting life-changing comfort, eternal comfort beyond words or sayings or emotions or platitudes. One who is able to see all wrong things set right is capable of comforting you, whatever you're going through. And once Jesus has comforted you, you can comfort others. Mourners who've been comforted are the best at comforting others. We, we call them wounded healers. People who have experienced what you've been through or been hurt in a way similar to you are the best people to comfort you, to let you know you have survived it. You will get to the other side of it. Check out what the church is supposed to do for one another. 2 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 3, says this, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffered. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Nine times, nine times in four verses, Paul says, comfort. It is a God who comforts you so that you can comfort each other. We are supposed to comfort people. Not not that you know it from sometimes Christian Christian social media posts or the things we choose to talk about. We're supposed to be comfort in a mad, mad world. We're supposed to be comfort to a world looking for answers, comfort to hurting people, comfort to people who feel uh, injustice and shut down. We are supposed to bring the gospel of comfort to people. We are meant to to make the afflicted comfortable, and to afflict the comfortable, Pastor Chris said last week. This is uh, the verse that I actually shared at my uncle's eulogy. I've only preached two, uh, well, three funerals now in my life. One was for my sister-in-law, she was 36, and the other was for my uncle. He was a sheriff's deputy who had seen some terrible things and been part of some terrible uh, um, uh, just discoveries, and the things weighed on him, and unfortunately, he took his life. And I literally was sitting there in the back of um, the room. He was laid in state with an honor guard, uh, and I hadn't written his eulogy yet. And I'm literally just praying that God would give me something. And this is the verse that drop, God dropped into my mind. Because I'm surrounded by officers who, after this service, have to get up and go back on the streets and deal with things that I can't even imagine. I have to offer something to the rest of my family, to the friends there who are all asking the question that none of us have the answer to. And so we understand that when we receive comfort from Jesus, it's not just for us. If you've been comforted in your life, don't keep that quiet. You were designed for the comfort you receive to hand it to others, to give it away freely. That's why God gave us the gift of each other. You're not designed to do life alone on purpose because somebody needs the comfort you have received. And the problem is that many times we don't want to admit we need to be comforted. In the world we live in right now, it is a big thing to have a stiff upper lip, to be stoic, to show that you don't need any help. And so if people knew we needed comforting, people might think less of us. That's what the kingdom of the world says, is put on a brave face, go out there, seize the day, 
and make it happen. And in the upside-down kingdom, God says, no, no, you are invited as part of God's family to need comforting because your father is a comforter. The church is not to just say, hey, don't struggle, don't have a hard time. The invitation of following Jesus is you're not meant to struggle alone. There is comfort for your affliction. There is comfort for your mourning. And that's where the next beatitude actually comes in as we wrap up this idea today. Mourning is happy when it makes us meek. When it makes us meek. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, this beatitude says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Meekness is a level of humility that allows for brokenness. It, it's to be authentic. It's to lead out of a limp. It's the acknowledgement that I'm a mess, that I'm a disaster, that I don't have to prove anything to you. Meekness does not mean quiet. In fact, meekness is not weakness. I think sometimes we think that meek people are weak people. And so just because it rhymes doesn't mean it's true. Being a doormat for people to walk over is not what God has called you to. In fact, we know that Jesus was meek. It says he was humble of spirit. And we also know that he still got jacked up and fired up at people, especially the religious elite. Jesus literally made a whip in church, flipped over the tables, and drove people out of his house. He was not weak. He was not passive. He was not a quiet guy. I think sometimes we think of Jesus like, like even right now, I think the way you probably think of him sitting on the Sermon on the Mount is like, hey guys, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Like, Jesus is not a sissy. Jesus is not a pushover. Jesus is not a monotone guru who has some thoughts on your life. Jesus is actually God himself, and he's passionate about the things that will bring you eternal salvation. So when he talks about uh, people getting out of his father's house because they've corrupted it, he's fired up about it. When he calls people out of their sin, he's fired up about it. When he calls his followers to come lay down their life, he's fired up about it. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. In fact, the word for meekness in the Greek is more about uh, war horses coming back. It's the idea of a horse whose kick could kill you, allowing you to put a bridle in its mouth and a saddle on its back and riding it. Meekness is power under control. It's the best illustration I can even think of to following Jesus. You may think you have all this power and control, but actually following Jesus is letting him put the bridle and guide you to bend your strength to his will, to bend who you are to what he has to say. As Christians, I think we think of meekness. It's this kind of thing. It means not rocking the boat. It means we'll sit quietly in the side of the room and not add to the discussion. And, and this causes so many Christians to become people pleasers, right? If they know I follow Jesus, I have to be meek. I can't say anything. I can't actually tell them the truth about anything because we become worried about what other people think. And meekness is not that. Jesus certainly wasn't timid or afraid of conflict. Again, he had the power of the Holy Spirit in him. He's healing people. He's raising people from the dead. He's calling out people's sins, and he's passionate. And so he calls his followers to follow like him, living like Jesus. Jesus, while meek, was not weak. But meek is authentic. It's one of my favorite things about this beatitude, that meekness is all about honesty. Being meek is about vulnerable. It's inviting other people into the room. It removes that competitive nature that every time you walk in, do you have a friend like that who turns everything into a competition, right? I can eat this faster than you. I can walk faster than you. I can load this car faster than you. I'm like, cool, have a good time. But sometimes people get so inauthentic, and God's followers, the upside-down kingdom, the people who follow Jesus, the people who will be blessed are people who have this authenticity, who lead from their flaws, they don't have to wear a mask. They don't have to have the pretense. They don't have to put on this good-looking thing to come to church. I mean, you still should look good, but you know what I mean? They don't have to pretend to be someone they're not because phony people attract phony people. If you're wondering why all the phony people are around you, start with yourself. Understand that meek is meant to be authentic. Meek people make room for other people. They understand they're not the smartest person in the room, and they invite others into the room with them. And this humility allows people to come as they are. It frees people up to be honest. In fact, this is the guiding principle of every recovery group, right? Sometimes you come to church. You've been guilty of it. I've been guilty of it. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And then you ask friend, how are you? Are you fine? Everybody's standing around. Everybody's fine. Cool. See you at home. And then I get your text message later in the day. I know you're not fine, but we think that we have to be this fake thing. But meek people are authentic. You go to an AA meeting. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, my name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Boom. 
No pretense. There is no mask. It is humility. It is meekness. It is authentic. And meek people have mourned and been comforted. Meek people don't need others' approval. Meek people feel free to be authentic. It's one of my favorite things about Searchlight Church. When you come here, you can say, I'm struggling or I'm hurting. And I'll say, how can I help you? How can I pray for you? Let me introduce you to somebody who's been through what you've been through. Out of the comfort they received, they can comfort you. Humility is a weakness in the world, but not in the upside-down kingdom. It's the only way we actually grow and have a human encounter with other people. Meekness gives people permission to not be fake, to come with their flaws and have an honest human encounter. When when Pastor Chris planted Searchlight, one of the first things he laid out for us was this idea of real people, real life, real love. That's one of the first things I think we ever wrote down regarding Searchlight Church. And, And every time that somebody gets up to speak at Searchlight, I love it because that's kind of what it is. You, we dress like we normally dress. We talk like we normally talk. Like I use jokes that I use off the stage, right? There's, there's no pretense. God, help me if I get up here and I ever do something up here that I wouldn't do on a Tuesday when no one's watching. I, I admit, I'm sarcastic. I have ADHD. I'm a little bit too quick to qu- crack a joke sometimes, and that works against me. But I'm pretty in touch with my shortcomings. And I think all that's on display on Sunday. I haven't gussied anything up here just because I'm talking to a video camera. I can be honest with who I am. That's part of meekness. And nearly every conversation I've had with people who come to search, like people who visit, people who stuck around, people who decide to follow Jesus uh, since they came here, over and over when I ask them, what is it that stood out about Searchlight Church? Over and over again, the answer is it was real. The people were real. The preaching was real in words I can understand. The smiles were real. There was no pretense. In fact, if that's your story and you're watching right now on Facebook, go ahead and say, that was me. All right, don't make me a liar right now. Go ahead and let people know that you stayed, you experienced Jesus at Searchlight because people were real here. We need to be people who are real and authentic because meek is authentic, and then this is the next important part. Authentic is attractive. Authentic is attractive As a leader at Searchlight Church, I want you to look at this dummy up here and say, okay, uh, I have permission to not have it all together. Look at the guy they let on stage. That's so essential to be imperfect. You have permission to be meek. Come as you are. Come to church as you are. It's okay to not be okay. This is our core value, number one. It's okay to not be okay. And immediately following that, but you won't stay that way. When you meet Jesus, when you come and meet him, he'll change you little by little. All of us are works in progress. None of us have arrived. Meek people understand that. So let's be honest works in progress so that people can see God is still working on us. That gives others permission to be imperfect. That gives other people permission to come as they are because people are attracted to that kind of honesty. You might say meekness seems like a a weakness to me, and, and I'm aware, but I'm not living for your kingdom. I'm living for the upside-down kingdom. Uh, I tell people all the time, my testimony, some of you know it, in the fifth grade I was institutionalized at Monmouth Medical Center for two weeks uh, because of intermittent explosive disorder. I broke in the windows in my mom's house, tried to cut my wrists. Don't know why, was just angry, a little messed up. The uh, aforementioned ADHD. I was on psychotropic drugs for three years. I saw a counselor for four years after that, eventually tapered off the, the meds, tapered off the counseling, and God still isn't done with me. And the reason I'm okay telling you that is because I don't have convince you that I'm that important or have it all together. In fact, I hope that my story lets you know that if you need medication, go see a psychiatrist. If you're having a hard time, you can make an appointment with a therapist, right? If your marriage or your finances need help, call and make an appointment. Get over yourself and be authentic because God's not calling you to have it all together. He's calling you to be authentic. You need to stop letting pride keep you from actually being meek enough to seek out the help that could save your life or your sanity, or your marriage. And so it's about actually being honest. I needed that medication. I needed that doctor. I needed that therapist because it would save my life. My parents would have killed me if nothing changed. I know it saved my life. Meekness is knowing it's okay to tell you all that. And if you think less of me, that's your problem and not mine. And that's what we all need to aim for. God has used my testimony to reach people far from him, and that is the thing I care about the most because authenticity is attractive in a world of fakeness. And that's how the church has grown 
for 2,000 years. Open up your life, even your failings, even your shortcomings. Be meek enough to invite people to see that you're not perfect, that God is still working on you. And that's how the church has grown for 2,000 years. We won't reach the world preaching to them that we're better than them. They just need to look like us. They need to fall in line with us. They don't need our best advice. They need to see Jesus. And so when we're meek enough to get out of the way, people can see him. People can see what he's done in your life. Not your opinion, not your advice. The world needs Jesus' love for broken people. So let them see that. And what's the payoff? As we wrap up today, what do meek people get? People who admit they don't have everything together or have it all figured out. People who know they haven't arrived. Jesus says they inherit the earth. And he's actually quoting from Psalm 37 here. Jesus says, soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The meek will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. The point of following Jesus is not to escape all of this and go to heaven and sit on a cloud and play harps. That's Tom and Jerry. That's nowhere in the Bible. If you read through the book of Revelation, Revelation 21 says there's a new heaven and a new earth where we'll reign as sons and daughters of King Jesus. This is a new creation untainted by sin and death and despair. The wicked, everyone we thought was winning this side of eternity who had built a beautiful kingdom for themselves, they're gone. They don't inherit the kingdom of heaven because they built their own kingdom and it didn't save them. The new kingdom, it's upside down to us. But this is the way things were way back in the garden. Originally, when we were actually walking with Jesus, seeing him eye to eye and seeing him in all his glory, we get that again. Go read Revelation 21 through 22. It's awesome. So who gets the kingdom? Who gets this kingdom? A person who inherits the earth surely has to be one who fought and clawed and made much of themselves and maneuvered and bargained. That's the regular kingdom. That's how the world would see it. This, this beatitude goes against that common sense idea that you have to fight for the kingdom you want because the meat, meek are often taken advantage of. They don't win the earth. Notice this key word as we wrap up today. Meekness leads to an inheritance. They inherit the earth. We inherit a kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world as a gift we have not earned by a king we cannot impress. Just as the poor in spirit have the kingdom of heaven, we have the kingdom of earth, a gifted inheritance. You didn't earn it. You didn't convince anyone you deserve it. You received it from the true owner. It was handed to you. And if you lose your life for Jesus, you'll find it. If you gain the whole world but lose your soul, these are upside down ideas in the kingdom of God. But when you submit to the leadership of God, you become his heirs, not by earning it, not by effort or victory, but by blood. You are an heir because of the blood of Jesus. You inherit the earth only one way, by being given it, by it being given to you by the one who owns it all. And so I'm, I'm proud to be an imperfect, jacked-up pastor, here leading imperfect, jacked-up people, because if we ever get anything right about our lives, it's by the grace of God. We don't have it all together. All we're doing is our best to follow Jesus, the perfect Savior, the King of an upside-down kingdom who is redeeming and renewing us day by day. We are poor in spirit. We mourn our sin. We allow Jesus to comfort us, but God gets glory when we stop living like we have everything together and let people see that he's working in us day by day. And everyone on the wide road can see what he is doing in his upside-down kingdom. And it will seem strange, but we inherit what we cannot earn from a king who withholds nothing from us, not even the life of his own son. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is the upside-down kingdom of God. And if you don't know this king, I, I want to tell you just a little bit about him as I close today, that he loves us so much. We used to have this beautiful relationship with him. That's what Genesis 1 through 3 is, that God created this beautiful place and walked with us and interacted with us, and we loved him every day. And one day we decided that this king and his kingdom didn't make sense to us, and so we staged a coup. We rebelled against him. We tried to overthrow the king and the kingdom because we thought we knew better than God. 
We wouldn't say it out loud that way, but that's the story of Genesis 1 through 3. And as you know, the, that didn't go well. Look around. It's still not going well. But the entire story of the Bible, what I get up and preach, what every church that preaches the Bible is explaining, is the entire story of the Bible is this loving king chasing down rebellious hearts and inviting us to please come home to come home and to return to this kingdom, to come back through the gate, understand that there's a price to pay because every penalty for a crime, it's weighed against the penalty for it is the person that you committed the crime against. So what is the penalty for rebelling against God? The wages of sin, unfortunately, is death. And that's what we all deserve. And that should lead us to mourn. But here's how we're comforted, that Jesus said, I will pay that price that I will come and pay the price for you so we don't have to, so we can inherit what we did not pay for or earn, so that we can inherit what God has for us. Jesus says, whoever accepts this exchange, my life for theirs, my righteousness for their rebellion is welcome back into the upside-down kingdom. We were made for his kingdom, and until we get back to it, we will seek everything else counterfeit but nothing will bring us joy. Our culture is about tolerating sin, but God's kingdom is about forgiving sin. And if you'd like to come back to the kingdom, it's as easy as declaring with your mouth that you submit to the lordship, to admit that you rebelled and ran away, to admit that we thought we knew better, that our kingdom could be greater than God's, and come back home. And and so if that's you, if you don't know this Jesus, and you want to decide that I'm tired of trying to be king of my little kingdom, everything I've built amounts to an empire of dirt, and I want to know this Jesus who lived for me and died for me and wants to spend an eternity with me, it's as simple as praying a prayer. And if even one person wants to do that, I'm going to lead us in the prayer. You just pray it out loud. The Bible says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. So if that's you, would you pray this with me? Dear Jesus, I know that I have sinned. I know that I can't save myself. I know that my kingdom is small. I know that I can't earn my way to you. And so would you come into my life, forgive me of my sin, forgive me of my rebellion, welcome me back into your kingdom. I know that you are my king, my savior, and my Lord. Help me live for you the rest of my life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you pray that, would you please put that in the comments? Don't leave this stream today and not tell somebody. You can put it on your connection card, but it's the best decision you will ever make because all the people watching with you who are following Jesus, we're just trying to figure it out step by step. Let me pray for the rest of you before we go. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, and I pray that you would just help free us who have heard your word that it's okay to mourn and to hurt. God, that you would help us to be comforted, those of us who are mourning, who are experiencing loss right now. Would you come and touch us deeply with your comfort? God, be enough for every hurt and every pain. God, we rely on you, the only one who can bring all comfort. God, I pray that once we've been comforted, we will comfort others. Give us opportunities, God, to love people well. Help us to to look at our sin as something that puts you on the cross and to mourn that, to, to keep us humble so that we can be loving other people, not judging them as people who sin differently from us, but just people who are mourning that need comfort from you. Give us words and opportunities to introduce people to you, Jesus. Thank you for being enough for us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you that we have a place in your kingdom. We rest in you, Jesus, our soon coming king. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me on Church Online today. I hope you have a great Sunday, and we'll see you back here next Sunday. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today for Church Online. Uh, Just want to remind you to like, comment, share this video, spread a little hope to those who need it. Also want to remind you that every Sunday at 1030 a.m., we are here at Seashore School, 410 Broadway in Long Branch, Uh, in the picnic area behind the school for a live time of worship and the message. Um, We've been having a great time for the last couple of weeks, and I would love to see more people start to come out and join us. Just want to assure you we're social distancing, we're wearing masks, and it's been an awesome, awesome time to worship together and to hear the word live and, and just to be together as the church. So next Sunday you can join us right back here 9 a.m. or outside at 10.30. And uh, also, as I mentioned in the announcements earlier, 
be on the lookout for a new online devotional starting next week, and we'll be sending out more information through social media. Guys, have a great day. Thanks for joining us today for Church Online.